Hello. Uh, my name is Kai. I work for Cluster HQ. Uh, we, we like to be known as the container data people. Um, Rob is our illustrious co uh, um, He's a co-founder and VP of engineering. So, products. Um, VP of products. Sorry, <laughs> same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll start by insulting my boss, that's a good start. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to talk to you about extending Docker with PowerStrip. Uh, PowerStrip is a project we've been working on for the last couple of months to try and extend the behavior of Docker. Um, Docker as it stands is a great tool, but there's other aspects that you need to run a whole fleet of Docker containers in production. And um, I'll talk more about that. So what is Docker? Let's start with a basic introduction. It's a container runtime. So much like Linux is an operating system, it's a process runtime. It, 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 it comes with its own kernel. Um, kernels manage the hardware on behalf of processes to access. Um, Docker is a, is, a, is a container runtime. It's another way of running processes as opposed to on a Linux host, you run a bunch of, a, a bunch of processes. Uh, Docker presents a totally different paradigm for running these processes. And, Every decade or so, there seems to be a huge revolution in computing. The last one was virtual machines, so VMware, the idea you can take a physical machine and slice it up. Um, Docker is a, a significant revolution along the same lines as, as virtualization. Um, so what are containers? They're basically, they use some features of the Linux kernel. So if you're running a Linux system, you have the kernel and user space. And the kernel is really the interface between any processes the user is running and the hardware on the machine. Um, so hardware is CPU and memory and uh, disk and network and all of the other things that aren't on that list. Um, there's some features of the Linux kernel in more recent Linux kernels. So you, know, you can't wind back five years and just run containers. Um, but the more, the, the more recent Linux kernels have got these things, C groups, that allow you to control the amount of memory and CPU time that individual processes have access to. Um, namespaces is about um, isolating uh, one process tree from another process tree, isolating one file system from another file system. Um, this kind of sounds a bit like a virtual machine. Where you're kind of you're starting several machines and you're running your whole bunches of processes in these different machines and you're kind of guaranteeing isolation between these different VMs. Uh, the the real difference, um, if we look at VMs to start with, each VM has its own kernel, right? So we've said that the kernel is the interface between user land processes and the hardware on the machine. Every time you create a new VM, it's creating a new kernel. Therefore. You can have any operating system you want. So you have the Windows kernel and the Linux kernel, and there's a whole bunch of other operating systems. The list is this long. They all have their own kernels. So if we have uh, five VMs running on a machine, uh, we could coexist Windows and Linux on the same machine. So that's virtual machine land. It's abstracting the hardware away from the operating systems. Um, all the processes on one VM share the network and the file system and the user IDs and the process tree. So if I start one process, it can see uh, by making a syscall to list all the processes, all the other processes on that machine. Um, because they all have their own kernel, they're quite slow. I mean, slow is a relative statement, but compared to containers, they're quite slow. This is the point. So, you know, some VMs could start quite quickly, but we're talking tens of seconds, right? So let's spin up a VM, let's sit back for 30 seconds, it's done, that was quite quick. This is the sort of scale that we're on with VMs. Containers are slightly different. Um, and it's just a, a little mention, there's more than one container system than just Docker. Docker is a way of running containers. Containers are a feature of the Linux kernel and have been around for maybe six, seven years. Don't quote me on the history there, but certainly Docker is, um, a more recent wrapper to the idea of containers. And Rocket, uh, by some guys called CoreOS, is an entirely different container runtime. So we mustn't get completely fixated on Docker, even though it's got a really nice logo and an excellent UI. It's not the only way to run containers. The real important point there, containers are a feature of the Linux kernel. The containers and Docker aren't the same thing. Docker creates and manages containers for you. That's the idea. Anyway. The main really important point 
is that two containers share the same kernel, whereas two VMs have different kernels, right? So I can have Windows in one VM and Linux in another VM because they have different kernels. So one is the Windows kernel, one is the Linux kernel. If we're running containers, right, I can have both containers running in a complete isolation, but they have to share the same kernel. So one can't be Windows and the other can't be Linux. They have to both use the Linux kernel. At the moment, all popular container systems are based on Linux, so we can just ignore Windows for a moment and all the other operating systems that's focused on Linux. Um, they can have, you can have different Linux distributions in different containers, though. So on the same host, I could be running an Ubuntu container alongside a Fedora container. And this is on the same Linux kernel, because fundamentally Fedora is just a bunch of files in a particular place with the Linux kernel. Ubuntu is a bunch of files in a particular place with the Linux kernel. And so they both share the same kernel and introduce a different file layout. Um, so different Linux distributions can coexist on the same Docker host. Different operating systems can coexist on, on uh, something like VMware or any hypervisor VM-based system. So each process has an isolated network file system user IDs and process tree. So that's the key difference, is that on a VM I may be running five processes, and they can all see the other processes and the users and the files and such forth. In Docker, each container can't see the other processes from the other containers. Um, and so because they're all sharing the same kernel, there's a technique in the kernel. This is the namespacing part of containers that separates this view from each process that you run in containers. And because mostly Linux is just a file layout, you know, everything in Linux is represented as a file, by separating the file tree from each process in a container, you're fundamentally kind of saying this is a different operating system to the other. It looks very much like a VM, but without the cost is the basic summary of why containerization over virtualization. Um, hence, they're very much smaller and very much faster. I mean, you can spin up a container if it's not a chunky process in less than 100 milliseconds, as opposed to 30 seconds for a VM. Um, oh, too, too keen on the button there. Right, so Docker. Let's go through some basic Docker concepts and some, I mean, can I just ask just quickly so I can get a scan? I mean, how many people have heard of Docker before tonight? Right, most people, that's good. How many people have used Docker before tonight? Okay, I'm going to say half. And how many people have Docker running in production in some form? Okay, a couple. I, was, I knew John was going to put his hand up there. Well, Rob as well, of course. Right, good, okay. Um, so I'm going to run through this and explain them then, because there's at least half the audience that, that might, might need this. So a Docker file, what is this? It's a kind of, it's a, it's a manifest for um, what you're going to, how to put this, uh, it's what you install, what's pre-installed in a container before you run it. Um, and so for instance, example, with a, with a virtual machine, I may take an Ubuntu image and install some packages and do some configuration and then perhaps save it as an AMI on Amazon, which is a way of sort of freezing a whole operating system and then booting new machines from that operating system. Um, so that's like a virtual machine image. Um, a Docker file is a text file that describes how you can build up the file system in preparation for a container to run. So it's very similar to the idea of having a virtual machine image. Um, and so you need a way of installing packages and deciding which language you're going to run. So in John's world, this is, I've got a Ruby Docker file and a Java Docker file. And they may well be based on different Linux distributions. As we've explored, that's okay. Um, so Docker files, how do I describe what's in my image before I run the thing? Um, an image is the binary artifact that building a Docker file produces. And so the Docker file is a text file. It contains instructions like apt-get install MySQL or any other Linux command will work inside a Docker file. When you build the Docker file, it basically runs those commands inside a container and saves the status of the state, saves the image of that container into a binary file. It uses um, copy or write file system which means if you sort of start with an Ubuntu-based image and create 100 containers all echoing hello1, echo, echo hello2 to 100, um, 
each actual image will be a couple of kilobytes because it's all using the base Ubuntu image. It's not copying the whole thing like virtual machines would be. So this concept of copy or write is quite important in the world of Docker because it means that you can spawn thousands of containers and not be worrying about disk space, which you would be if you're trying to spawn a thousand VMs on a computer. I want to see the size of this machine because it's going to be huge. Um, right, so Docker files build images. Containers are like running processes based on an image. So I could create myself, I don't know, a MySQL image, and it's based on Ubuntu. Right? So I'm going to say, here's a Docker file. It's based on Ubuntu. Apt get install MySQL and save that as an image. And at the moment, I don't have anything running. I just have a binary file that represents an image that you can run the container from. So next step is for me to say, let's run that image and now I have a running container. So think very much of a container as a process. Perhaps it's a process manager like Supervisor D that in turn launches other processes, but let's forget process tree. Let's just say the moment I run a container, I'm running a process. And that process has an isolated view of its file system, isolated view of users, network, etc. Um, Networking, I mean, everyone knows what networking is, but let's just make the point that if I'm running more than a single container, these things want to start to speak to each other. So if I'm writing an app with my MySQL, it started, now I've got, I don't know, a node server that needs to speak to the MySQL. Somehow, we need to get this container speaking to that container. So that's fairly obvious, I won't spend too much time on that. Storage, which a lot of people, and this is our basic business model, is a lot of people forget about storage in the wonderful euphoria of spinning up all these containers with different language runtimes and such forth, and this is amazing, Docker is the future, and then, oh, but hang on, where do I save my data to? <laughs> so if you're running any kind of database or anything that saves state, storage becomes a thing you have to think about because you're inside a container, how do I persist that data across the container restarting, or even worse, the host blows up, and how do I get the data onto another host? So storage is something we should think about uh, when we come to run containers. Orchestration is another thing, because the moment that I start uh, running a collection of containers on more than one host, I need to start thinking about, well, what, what's deciding which host runs containers on, uh, so what, what's deciding which container runs on what host? So I could manually do that. I could log into node one, docker run, log into node two, docker run. When you start to get 100 nodes in your cluster, you need a tool that's running these things and deciding where to schedule them onto. So that's a kind of overview of the world of Docker and the sorts of concepts that we have. Um, so yeah, I mentioned Docker files. They're, they're text files that describe how to build a binary image. Um, you can base your Docker file on an existing Docker file. So a common pattern you see on the Docker Hub is um, I might I might create a Python app Docker file, and all of that all that does is it gets an Ubuntu or a Fedora or whatever choice my base operating system will be. It will install Python, and then that's it. It kind of does nothing else other than prepare a Linux distribution with a certain arrangement of files in place for me to do something with. And then I may well say my web app is based on my Python image, my billing app is based on my Python image, and my authentication app is based on my Python image. And these three Docker files are where I'm starting to include actual code that I'm going to run in my container. And so, again, that's using that copy on write file system trick that we described earlier, where you're not duplicating three entire operating systems, you're saying, take my base level operating system with Python installed, there's this file system, the Google Cloud, and it's got symmetric keys to make that fully secure and encrypted. So you can kind of now have a globally distributed network that feels very much like it's a single hub and everything is just an IP address on this local network. It vastly simplifies the other ways of networking Docker containers, let's put it that way. Does that um, use like a VPN technology, like IPsec or something? No, no, um, it's a good question. Um, Socket Plane and um, vSwitch um, use that, that world. Um, Weave has got its own router 
Um, and so Weave has got like a gossip network where all of the routers on the Weave net network are gossiping to each other. So each router knows about the presence of the other routers. Right. They're all reporting their MAC address and they're also reporting which IP addresses that MAC address is responsible for looking after. Right. Uh, which means that you can kind of detach an IP address from host A and attach it to host B. And all of the Weave routers now know about that and will reroute the data accordingly. I mean, let's not make any bones. Any um, virtual overlay network or software-defined network is going to be slower than the physical network. You know, but not by a noticeable amount. And in terms of, um, in terms of the, com the, the complexity it reduces, I think it's, it's, it's very much... Uh, uh, it, how to put this? It's very much how things are going to be done. Um, in terms of running hundreds of containers across tens of hosts and upwards. Uh, if, you have, if you have a much smaller number of hosts, you can almost manually configure this stuff. Um, but it doesn't still answer the question we'll look at later, which is what happens if one host goes away and we need to move this IP address. And so virtualizing your network is the same as virtualizing your hardware. It kind of offers a set of advantages, but it's slightly slower. I've slightly gone off track there. but. Um, how do you use Weave? You, you, you run the Weave command, right? So there's no Docker run here. You say Weave run. Um, you give it the IP address that you want this container to have, and then everything this side to the right of my hand is the same as if you just said Docker run to the left of it. Does that mean that Weave is only designed to run with Docker then? Indeed, absolutely. Because, it's, yeah, because when you say Weave run, internally it's creating this virtual, um, the, the, the Weave bridge is informing about the IP address, and then it's internally running the command docker run. Uh, so think of Weave as a, a tool that wraps the docker command, right? So you say Weave run, it does a bit of setup, it says docker run, and now that container has the Weave IP address attached to it. Um, so yeah, I mean, very much Weave is a docker tool. Um, Socket plane is a Docker tool. Calico is a Docker tool. So all of these three networking tools are focused on Docker at the moment. Poor Rocket, it needs a bit more luck, but I'm sure that will happen. <laughs> right, Flocker. Um, it manages data volumes across hosts. So very similar to this concept of like a movable IP address. You're going to need to move the data at some point. I mean, the classic use case uh, is, is migration. So you're looking at your database and thinking, man, it's running really slow. It's because it's got a spinning disk and every time it does a lookup, it's having to do this actual moving stuff. Why don't we get an SSD, but I've got 20 gigs of data on my spinning disk. How do I move that with minimal disruption and downtime? Um, and so Flocker excels at that. It uses the ZFS file system, which has got a, a snapshotting technique and a technique we call the two-phase push, which means that you move the, the bulk of the 20 gigs over to the other machine. You then cut connections to the original machine. You move the diff, which is often very small, um, and then start the second container and connections continue. So there's a vastly reduced downtime. There's some, but a vastly reduced downtime compared to if you just said, kill this original container, move the 20 gigs, and start everything up again. Um, this is this line here, and it's important to note, I didn't write this down, but Flocker's got this concept of um, pluggable storage backends. And so at the moment we have a ZFS backend, but we're working on a block device backend, which is an entirely different use case. Uh, so something like um, Amazon EBS or um, OpenStack Cinder, these are kind of block device backends, meaning uh, they just save blocks of data to a disk. You're left to make the file system on, on that device. And Flocker will initialize the file system and attach that file system to a container, allow you to write data onto that file system. Um, imagining this host then blew up, uh, Flocker would very quickly be able to attach the same volume because the, the storage is away from the host the container is running on in this instance. Uh, to another container running on another host. Um, so the ZFS backend is very much a use case for migration. So you're like, here's my database server, I want to migrate it to there. The block device backend is very much a use case for high availability. Like, you know, the moment this blows up, it's okay, because I can just start the database process on another machine and it's attached to the same block device. Uh, so think of Flocker as an abstraction away from the various solutions you can use for storage. Um, it allows you to manage the idea of I've got some data attached to that container uh, and move the data and the container together as a single unit. Um, again, 
it wraps the Docker command. And this is the theme of what we're talking about, is that rather than say Docker run this, you're, saying, you're using a command called Flocker deploy, and in amongst that whole process, it'll end up calling Docker run on the hosts. Um, so both, sorry. Well, if you want to have Weaver Flocker at the same time? It's a, such a good question. I've even <laughs> thought of you asking that question, and I'm about to move on to a good answer. So rather than answer you directly, I'm going to say you're slightly, you're slightly um, psychic, and you saw what's coming, right? Um, because exactly, let me, yeah, let me grab it, because both tools wrap the Docker run command, you can't combine them, because they fight over Docker now. You can't say we've run but actually get Docker to deploy at the same time. Yeah, sorry, Flocker to deploy at the same time. It, it, it's just not going to happen because both of them take control of the Docker uh, CLI and do their thing individually. There's no way of combining Flocker and Weave in that world. Exactly. Um, so here is this point. They, they both extend a single Docker daemon. What does that mean? It means that um, Imagine we have 100 Docker hosts. Uh, we're looking at Docker and Weave, uh, Flocker and Weave on a single one of those hosts with a single Docker server. Um, and they're both wrapping that single Docker server, which is this point. You, if, if you say Weave run, you can't say, and by the way, run Flocker at the same time on that container. Um, so here it is. The, the tools that wrap the Docker CLI can't work together in harmony uh, because they're both trying to claim access to the, the Docker binary. We need. Um, also, it's a very important point, that means orchestration tools can't use these extensions either. So if I'm using Flocker in its native form and Weave in its native form, I can't now say I want to use Mesosphere, Kubernetes, Swarm or Fleet to manage my cluster because all of these orchestration tools are trying to access the Docker binary. They're not programmed to say Weave run or Flocker deploy. Uh, we'd have to entirely hack the code base of all four orchestration tools if we wanted to get all of these things to play together, right? So it's obvious we need a better way <laughs> of doing this thing because it's nigh on impossible at the moment. Um, so a quick background as to what Docker actually is. It's got two halves. It runs a, a daemon on a Linux host. So this is just an example of how you run the Docker daemon. You say dash d run as a daemon. Uh, listen on this Unix socket. Use the AUFS storage driver. We won't go too much into detail as to that line, but think of Docker as running as a daemon on a Linux host. It's sat there listening on that Unix socket. It can also listen on a TCP socket. Um, either one is fine. The other half of Docker is the command line client that speaks to that daemon. So earlier on when we were saying Docker run, um, what's actually happening is it's sending some HTTP requests to the Docker server. Um, so it looks like almost Docker is just a binary and it just does its stuff, but no, it's very much too hard. It's the server that's listening for HTTP requests and it's the client that's sending those HTTP requests. Um, and I really like this line. Think of Docker as a REST API for processes, right? So um, you've got REST APIs for a whole bunch of different stuff, like Twilio is a REST API for phone systems. Um, Docker is a REST API for running processes. That's a great picture. I like that one. Um, so let's just think about these, these HTTP requests that the Docker client is sending to the server. Um, if I was to go Docker run Ubuntu echo hello, right? what we're saying is run the Ubuntu image and run the command echo hello in the Ubuntu image. And what actually happens is from the Docker client, it sends the following JSON body to the Docker server. Uh, on this URL, so it posts this JSON to that URL. And the Docker server is a REST API that sat there listening for incoming HTTP requests. It gets this and it says, ah, so somebody wants me to create a container based on the following information. And if you, I've cut this down, there's a lot more data in a Docker create request than just this, but this is the very basic stuff. You see, from the image Ubuntu, run these arguments in the image. There is uh, a basic Docker create request. Um, if I'm mounting volumes or I'm mapping ports and there's a whole gamut of Docker run options, you'll see this body change to reflect what options you put on the command line. So just think of this JSON body as like a, uh, a reflection of what Docker run command that you've written. Um, it will reply with an ID of your container saying, hey, I've just created that container that you wanted me to, here is the ID. 
Uh, the next step is that the Docker client will take that ID, and because you said Docker run, it will turn straight back around and say, okay, can you start that container now? Um, but the key thing to understand there is it's possible to create a container and not start it, right? So I might say, create these 100 containers and bring them up all very slowly in sequence. And so there's a separate stage from creating a container and starting a container. Um, but both cases are just uh, HTTP POST requests to the Docker daemon. Uh, so what is PowerStrip? It's a system, it's a HTTP proxy that sits between the Docker client and the Docker daemon. And what that means is that if the Docker client says Docker run something, it's going to hit PowerStrip before it hits Docker. And that means that we're now able to capture that JSON packet, do something with it, send it on to Docker. All of a sudden, we have a way of using the Docker command line, Docker run, but changing the behavior of a container that started. Um, so we have pre-hooks. These are things that happen before the body hits the Docker daemon, and post-hooks, which happen after the response is given by the Docker daemon. Um, so if we look at examples of PowerStrip, the overview, so the Docker client is here, I'm saying Docker run, it's sending a HTTP request, but I've pointed the Docker client at PowerStrip rather than the actual Docker server. Um, it's intercepting that request and it's sending it out to the pre-hooks that have been configured. Right? So each pre-hook now is told, somebody's creating a container, here's all the data for that container, do with it what you like. In some cases that might be nothing, it might be uh, allocate a, a network IP, it might be uh, prepare a volume, um, and then pass this request onto the next pre-hook, onto the next pre-hook. All the pre-hooks are done. PowerStrip says, okay, everything that's happened has happened. I'm now going to send this to Docker. And Docker has no picture that it wasn't just the Docker client speaking directly to the Docker server. It doesn't know that PowerStrip... So if you like, PowerStrip is like a constructive man in the middle attack. Right? It's sat there, it's going, I'm going to capture what you intend to do, I'm going to change that, and now I'm going to send it on. And neither party really knows that something has happened in the middle. Um, what are these adapters? Well, these are the actual things that know how to affect these Docker requests going through PowerStrip. Um, we have a Weave adapter, a Flocker adapter, a bunch of other adapters. Um, and these are things that understand how to affect the container without having to wrap the docker run command. Um, so they're HTTP endpoints. So uh, a request hits PowerStrip. It says, oh, I've been registered with two adapters. So I'm going to basically do a HTTP post with this JSON body I've just received to the adapter. So what does that mean? To write a PowerStrip adapter, I just need to write a HTTP endpoint. It can be in any language. I, it's almost in any language. It's fairly trivial to say, create a HTTP server, listen to incoming requests. That's it. That's all I need. So I can write one in Ruby, in Go, in Node, in Python. It doesn't matter what language uh, a PowerStrip adapter is in, especially because they can run in containers. So we get all the advantage of containerization with the adapter itself. Um, they're blocking. That's quite important to mention. Um, until an adapter says, I'm now done with that, nothing else will happen. So there's not this idea where Docker is busy making the container and you're like, I still needed to kind of set up this IP address before you start it. The PowerStrip will not do anything until every single adapter has dealt with the request, passed it onto the next adapter, passed it onto the next one, and now it's finished. PowerStrip will only now tell Docker about that request. And that's important because it means an adapter may take five, ten seconds to do something. I don't know, let's create a Cinder backend for OpenStack. Who knows how long that's going to take? Uh, we, we can't have other stuff happening whilst an adapter is busy doing its thing. Um, so yeah, adapters are blocking. And as I've pointed out, they chain. So the output of one adapter is the input of the next. Um, so if I've modified the environment of a container and my next adapter will see that modification of the first adapter. Um, next thing, so pre-hooks, this is this idea of um, something getting triggered before Docker gets the request. So in the, in the example of Weave, which is this diagram here, sorry it's so small, um, pre-hooks are really useful for changing the container before it hits Docker. So in the world of Weave, 
we're basically doing a whole bunch of remapping on the container to get weave to work and for it to block before the weave IP is present. Um, there's quite a lot of hacks going on, but it doesn't really matter because Docker is just going to receive <coughs> the, the JSON packet that the, the weave adapter has changed. It doesn't know that this is busy changing everything before the Docker server receives it. So that's a pre-hook. It's basically happening before the Docker server sees it. It's very useful for changing the properties of the container. Um, post hooks happen after the Docker server has done its thing. Now you get told. And so that's really useful for kind of reacting to containers starting. Or um, So for instance, service discovery is a great use case for post hooks, where um, you, you kind of tell etcd or console that a service exists. But obviously, the container itself needs to be running before you do that. And so that's a great example of a post hook. Um, so because adapters are containers, um, you run them with a docker run command. Um, some adapters need to speak to docker themselves. Um, so to do that, you just mount the docker socket into the, into the adapter. And now, uh, with Weave, for example, um, if it receives the, 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 the request to create a container, it needs to ask docker, oh, what's the details of the image for this container, by the way? So the adapter gets the request, it turns around to docker and says, please give me the details for this image, scans that, changes the container, and then carries on. And so an adapter itself can speak to Docker, um, and you run them as containers. You can, you can run them as normal HTTP endpoints as well. That's OK. Um, PowerStrip itself is a container. Uh, we can see here we're linking um, two adapters to it. Um, so we've got the Weave adapter and the Flocker adapter. Um, and we're both thinking, is it really bad if I go to the loo? Huh. I sort of stood here hopping, and I'm like, it'd be better if I just went and did that. Go, go, is that go, all right? Go, go. I think I've drunk, like... Uh, <laughs> 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 it's like Forrest Gump. Right, Forrest? Pizza has arrived, yeah, we'll start here with time. <laughs> I could probably <laughs> I could probably field some questions if anybody has any questions in the meantime. <laughs> Can you point PowerStrip to another PowerStrip? Um, you could, but um, PowerStrip's adapters are contain uh, chainable, so. Um, if you want to do multiple things, you would just chain PowerStrip adapters, light plugins um, together. What, why are you? Why? I mean, yes, you can. You can point PowerStrips at multiple PowerStrips. Sure. I don't know. I was kind of thinking like decorator. Yeah. You put multiple decorators on top of a single function. Yeah. You uh, for that you would do multiple adapters, and in the PowerStrip configuration uh, YAML, you specify a list of ordered adapters, so plugins. Um, so if you want to do a sequence of things, you would use that. Is there any reason why you couldn't? No, no reason why you couldn't whatsoever. If you want to have a chain of 100 power strips, fine. Or something else. Something else? Something else that's like a power strip. Well, other proxies, sure. Sorry about that. I was like, oh, maybe I can just quickly hurry up and get to the end, but then it was, I was going to disgrace myself. Right, we're done. Um, and also, I have to hurry up because we have pizza, which is not a bad thing at all. So, but I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to run through it now. So basically, the, the point I'm getting to is we've got this thing called PowerStrip. It's a proxy. It captures the incoming request before they hit Docker. Uh, we run it as a container. We run the adapters as containers. Um, we configure it. I heard Rob talking about the configuration. Uh, this is this idea of um, chaining adapters, right? So the output of the Flocker adapter becomes the input of the Weave adapter. I can have several adapters for any endpoint. And so if you go and see the Docker documentation, um, it's got a huge amount of documentation on all the various endpoints that it supports. So containers create is an important one. Containers start is an important one. Those are the two we're focusing on. But there's a whole bunch as well. You can say containers list. So I could say, what I'm going to do is uppercase the name of every image name when you do Docker PS, right? And that would be like, OK, I'm going to, I'm going to match the root slash containers slash uh, list. I can't quite remember the root. But the real point is that I can override any of the uh, HTTP API endpoints for Docker that I want using this configuration file. Um, 
here I'm saying, how do I contact the adapters themselves? So when I say Flocker here, I mean this adapter here. And it's just a HTTP endpoint. So just quickly to explain, when I ran PowerStrip itself, I'm linking to another container. That's what this command here does. And that means from inside PowerStrip, I can use the word, the host name Flocker to speak to the Flocker container. That's what this is here. But that could also be that like you could run a PowerStrip adapter on the internet with a proper domain name. So that could be flockerpowerstrip.com, or it could just be an IP address. It doesn't have to be a container linked. Uh, basically, the point here is I can configure what I like. PowerStrip doesn't have opinions over what endpoints you should override and how you should contact the adapters, as long as it's a HTTP endpoint is the real example. So the real thing is that this now means I can say docker run and trigger this extra behavior. I'm not saying weave run or flocker deploy. I can say use the standard vanilla Docker client and still trigger networking and storage. Um, why is that so important? Um, well, it means that the orchestration tools can now use these extensions. So Mesosphere and Kubernetes and Fleet and a Swarm can now have networking and storage because they're not, and they don't even know that there's something funky going on behind this Docker server. They're just speaking standard Docker run commands. Um, two adapters can be combined now because they're not both fighting over the Docker run command. Uh, and that means that we can have one container with both networking and storage plugged in. Um, so here's an example of running a, a, a Docker container that has both a Weave IP address and a Flocker volume in one Docker run command. And how I'm passing this information is the Weave uh, adapter reacts to an environment variable and the Flocker adapter reacts to any volumes you've mounted in the container. But the key thing is I'm using the command docker run and these extensions are now happening behind the scenes rather than having to try and wrap the docker command and where they're fighting with each other. Um, I'm nearly to the end now, which is great. So Docker Swarm is this tool, one of the four orchestration tools I've mentioned. Uh, it manages m multiple physical hosts behind a, a common Docker API. Um, it, the bolt basically multiplexes these various Docker hosts behind it. Um, what that means is that I could have a Swarm cluster with all of these adapters plugged in. So it's a kind of, there's a whole chunk in this diagram, but these are two physical hosts, host A, host B, and here is my swarm master. And so swarm is aware of these two hosts. As far as swarm is concerned, there's two Docker servers on other servers. So my Docker run hits here, and swarm is a scheduler. So it decides, I'm going to throw this on host B. I'm going to throw that on host A. Um, swarm has got no idea, though, that these two Docker servers actually have both Flocker and Weave plugged into them. And again, it's really to hammer this point home. By, by creating a Docker proxy, we're allowed to use all of the existing Docker tools in this very rich ecosystem of stuff that people are busy building, um, and they don't fight with each other. It's like PowerStrip becomes the middleman between Docker tools and orchestration tools. Um, right, so it, just as a, a quick example, um, a classic use case would be to migrate a database from one host to another. Um, before we do the migration, um, here is a host A and here is host B. It was the example I pointed out earlier where we have a database running on a spinning disk. We decide that's far too slow. We want to move this container to that host, but we want to take the data and the IP address with it because uh, very badly I've hard-coded the IP address into the HTTP server and that can't be changed. So just let's roll with the example you might all say, just change the IP address to something different, but let's imagine we have to have it be this IP address. And we want that database to end up on this host for us not to change any code and for the data to be there in the new host and for it to use the same IP address in the new host. So this is what that would look like once I've done the migration. It's still communicating between the two processes on that IP and all the data is still there as I'd originally written it. Um, now that is a classic use case for PowerStrip is to combine two adapters and to have an orchestration framework sat in front of them. Hang on, sorry. There you go. Uh, have an orchestration framework sat in front of them that isn't aware of these two adapters. Um, so I think I'm going to skip to the end now. It, the main point to make here is that PowerStrip is a prototyping system. 
So let's not be thinking, I'm going to run production systems and write power strip adapters. <coughs> That's not what it's for. What it's for <coughs> is for very quickly, uh, to very quickly develop extensions, prove that they work, prove that they don't work, have a play around with it. What we really want is an official way to extend the Docker daemon, not to have a kind of man-in-the-middle attack and hope that that's fine. We want Docker itself to be able to, when a container arrives and it needs a networking setup, when a container arrives it needs a mounted volume, to be able to contact external extensions in a similar way that PowerStrip contacts adapters and for those extensions to take over the management of network and storage. Um, now, our CTO, Luke, has been working really hard on trying to get this into core Docker and has been succeeding to a large degree. Um, and so, really, the message there is if you write a power strip adapter today, there'll be very little work to do when Docker announced their official extensions mechanism. Um, so, for instance, with power strip Weave and power strip Flocker, two adapters that we're very close and responsible for looking after, uh, our full plan is when Docker announced their official extensions mechanism, we're just going to be changing a couple of um, uh, HTTP requests and the, the arrangement of the JSON packet. All of the back-end work is all in place, ready for these adapters, these power strip adapters, to become official Docker extensions. And that's really the kind of the big picture, if you like. Why does power strip exist? It's to galvanize, encourage, uh, and enthuse the general community to be write, writing Docker extensions and to get Docker themselves to really live, uh, you know, come good on their promise of uh, batteries included but removable. Um, and can I ask who's heard this phrase, batteries included but removable? Wow, pretty much nobody. <laughs> okay, so I'll explain it real quick. Is um, Docker is basically worried that um, they're becoming, with $40 million in funding, that they're becoming like a platform that's trying to do everything and yet encourage the ecosystem of people working on supporting tools around Docker to feel like they still have a business and a future. Um, and so they've coined this phrase, batteries included, i.e. they want to do networking, they want to do storage, they want to do orchestration, but everybody else should feel comfortable trying to develop tools that also do these things and you could take the Docker batteries out and put the, the, the upgraded batteries in and that's fine. And so really um, the message here is that um, you know, give it a couple of months, a period of time, I can't say exactly when and what version, but uh, fairly shortly you'll hear an official Docker announcement. We now have an official extensions mechanism, and you'll notice that it'll be using a system very, very similar to what I've just described with PowerStrip. Um, and that's really the, the, the main objective, is to have a world where Docker extensions are a first-class citizen, everybody can go and write them, and this world of kind of, you know, tools fighting over the docker run command becomes a 2014 issue and we've got to a place where there's a healthy ecosystem of companies and people using these extensions. Um, right, that's it. It's time, but there's a couple of things. It's a quick, very quickly. Um, we're running a new format of meetup. It's like a workshop. Um, we're going to run one maybe a month, maybe six weeks time. So if any of you guys run sort of production-y systems, in a distributed way, it would be really great to hear from you afterwards and um, I'd encourage you to come to the storage workshop which is basically a different format because rather than talks and people passively listening, it's something that involves the whole meetup and we split up into sort of groups of five and we have challenges that each group discusses and we all present the, the findings we have at the end. So if any of you guys are kind of A, responsible for systems and B, like going to meetups, then please come and have a chat with me afterwards because that's something we're doing. Um, our UX designer, Alice, is very busy trying to improve Flocker. So if in any way you want some free Amazon vouchers, can't be a bad thing. Uh, again, come and speak to me or visit this URL because she's very keenly trying to acquire uh, feedback from the community. We're hiring. If anybody likes the world of Docker and is a, is a good engineer, then please come and speak to any of us three afterwards. Um, and finally, thank you very much. And can I take some questions? Are we good for time? Or oh, cold pizza. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. okay, questions or pizza. This is a little experiment <laughs> in psychology. <right> now. <laughs> um, we can do both. Can do questions. Both. Let's do, do questions. Go on. Surely, just if anybody has any questions. Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we may yeah. just not have any questions, which is either a good or a terrible thing. I'm not sure.
Thank you.